guys. So we are live for day one of the Holiday Hangover Repair Camp. I'm so excited to bring this to you guys. I've been working on this for quite a while now. Um, for those of you who maybe are new to me and my work, my name is obviously Amber Rochelle and I am an intuitive life coach that works with highly sensitive women and I'm a sensitivity expert. Um, and so I'm also rocking my brand new sensitive badass shirt, which I'm going to shamelessly plug and put a link to in the comments below because you can get these on Teespring now. Uh, we have tanks and hoodies and mugs and really cute stuff. So I'll put the link to that below. But um, so I wanted to kind of tell you guys a little bit about why I decided to do this holiday hangover camp. Um, and you know, I, I really feel like this time of the year, there's so much joy and there's a lot of blessings and there's a lot of really great stuff that can come this time of the year. But for a lot of us, and especially those of us who are highly sensitive, it can bring up a lot of really big feelings. And not only that, but it's a very busy time of the year, right? So there's a lot of social obligations and things to keep up with and that can become very overwhelming for us. And what tends to happen for us sensitives is that by the time we get to the end of the holiday season, we're completely depleted and wiped out and exhausted and overwhelmed and just not really feeling, you know, that good going into the new year. It's really not a good headspace to be in when we're going into a new year, which is, a, you know, a time for really powerful intention setting. And so it's difficult for us because we just feel like we just want to crawl under the covers and stay there all day or all week rather. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I really wanted to bring this to you guys because I know that I've had a lot of holidays where I just felt really, really awful when they were over um, and, you know, just extremely wiped out. And I've learned a lot of really amazing and powerful tools for how to no longer let that happen to me. Now, I'm not saying that I don't still get overwhelmed during the holidays. I do, but it's not nearly the same. And I'm able to come out of them now, um, you know, feeling fresh and ready for the new year. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about in the next three days. And so I'll just give you a little outline for what we're gonna talk about today on day one. Um, so if I'm looking down, it's just cause I have my laptop right here. Anyway, so today we are gonna be talking kind of about like what it means to be sensitive and you know, what like, obviously if you are sensitive, you know this, but for some people, they don't actually know about the genetic portion of it and how, you know, the brain science behind it and really how our nervous system and our brain neurons are wired um, that causes us to experience the world in such a different way than people who don't have this genetic trait, right? So I'm gonna to touch on that. Um, we are gonna talk about setting boundaries with grace. So boundaries are one of, I think, the hardest things for us as sensitives, um, because we can feel other people's feelings so deeply, it's very, very hard for us to say no. We're very natural people pleasers, and that in and of itself is a beautiful thing, the you know, that we want to make people happy, but the shadow side of that is that we often end up putting ourselves last and having a hard time saying no to things, which again adds to exhaustion and overwhelm. So we're gonna cover, you know, how we can start to set boundaries with grace and without feeling guilty about them, right? Um, I want to talk about feeling our feelings and why it's so important for us as sensitives to really, really have a powerful tool belt for, you know, how to manage all of the big feelings that we have because we feel things so deeply and we carry a lot of emotion. And if we're not equipped with the right tools to know how to process that and be able to let those emotions go, it can lead to a whole myriad of problems. So we're going to dive into that. Um, let's see. We are also going to talk about, you know, what kind of drives us to put our needs in front or put our needs last rather um, and put everybody else's needs first and how we can kind of flip the script on that and get ourselves really set up for a more powerful new year. So that's just a little outline of what we're going to go over today. Um, and I'm going to do Q&A at the end, but if you guys have any questions as we're going along, please feel free to throw those up there. I will try and make sure that I address everybody's questions. I want you to feel super supported and know that, um, you know, first of all, really know that you are not alone. Like there's a lot of people, if you're not already in my super sensitives group, I, I encourage you to join. And I'll put that link below too. There's so many people in there. There's a lot of people that signed up for these live streams because there's a lot of sensitive people out there and we can feel very, very alone and feel very misunderstood because we're technically a minority. So it's 20% of the population that has this genetic trait of high sensitivity. 
And so I'm sure you guys, you know, will nod your heads to this. For most of us who are sensitive, we grow up getting feedback from the world around us that, you know, there's somehow something wrong with us. I mean, people will say, why are you so sensitive? Why are you so dramatic? Why do you take everything so personally, right? I'm sure you guys have heard this stuff. And it's not that they're trying to be mean necessarily. It's just that they don't understand because their whole physiology is different than ours and their nervous system is wired different than ours. And so they don't understand how we experience the world. But what happens when we get these messages, especially at a very young age, is that we start to feel like there's something wrong with us, that we don't fit in, that we're weird somehow, right? And most importantly, we start to disconnect from our own feelings because we've gotten the feedback that our feelings are somehow not valid, right? That our feelings are too big or too dramatic or that we overreact to everything. And so, especially as children, you know, we make that mean something about us and we say, instead of like, oh no, these people just don't get me, right? Which we can say as an adult, but as a child, right? We're like, oh, I can't trust my feelings because everybody's telling me that they're somehow wrong. And so we then disconnect from our own feelings. And this is something that, you know, is really hard to repair unless you have the right tool belt. And so we are going to be getting into that. Um, so for those of you watching now or watching the replay, that don't know or, or you know, haven't done a ton of research into the highly sensitive genetic trait. It is, um, it literally is, hi Brit, hey honey, um, it literally is a genetic trait. And so there's this amazing woman, Elaine Aaron, she is a psychotherapist and she was the one that coined the term the highly sensitive person. She did a ton of research on this in I believe the early 90s. Uh, and she wrote a book called The Highly Sensitive Person. And I first read that book when I was, God, I want to say like 21 or 22 or something. And it blew my freaking mind because I, like a lot of us sensitives, thought that there was something deeply wrong with me, right? I thought I like hated myself. I went through a long time of having really low self-esteem because I felt like I was flawed and weird and different and nobody understood me. And therefore, you know, I felt like I wasn't good enough. And when I read this book, I was like, oh my God, there's an explanation for all of the weirdness about me, right? Um, thanks, honey. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I encourage all of you watching or watching the replay, if you haven't read that book before, pick it up. Um, the, the thing about it is it explains, you know, basically how our brains work in a different way than people that don't have this genetic trait. So for those of us who are highly sensitive, we basically have, I mean, I like to call it a sixth sense, you know, this is the cool part of it, but our brain neurons process data like much more thoroughly and deeply than people who don't have this trait. And so we're literally picking up more information from the world around us than other people. And that's why to us as sensitives, it can feel like the volume on life is turned up all the way, all the time, right? This is why we have such a hard time in crowds, in malls, um, you know, if, if we get overwhelmed with social engagements because it's overwhelming because we are taking in so much data from the world around us. And on top of that, we have more activation in what's called our mirror neurons. So mirror neurons are the part of our brain that gives us empathy. So basically, you know, if I see somebody pick up a cup of coffee, coffee and drink from it, my brain fires as if I'm doing that as well. So for those of us who are sensitive, we have more activation in that area. And this is why it's so easy for us to tune into how other people are feeling, right? So we also have a more delicate nervous system. Honestly, we get frazzled much more easily. When you're sensitive, you need much more self-care. You need more sleep. You need to really pay attention to your diet and nutrition. Any little thing like that can really throw us off center. And, but I want to, so that's kind of like some of the brain science, but pick up that book. The book is fascinating. But I want to really quickly say, just because we have, you know, a, a more sensitive nervous system, just because we can get thrown off our center more easily, does not make us weak. And this is a really important thing, you guys, because again, unfortunately, the messages that we get from the world are that we need to toughen up, right? Or, you know, that we're thin skinned. Okay, so fucking what? Yeah, we're thin skinned. That's not necessarily a bad thing. And so what I teach is not, I'm not here to teach you how to toughen up because that's not the point. That's not what we need to thrive. What we need to thrive is we need to understand and appreciate and take care of and love the thin skin that we're in. 
not try and toughen up and be like everybody else. Because as much as there is a lot of challenges that come with being sensitive, there's so many powerful gifts that come with it too, you guys. And when you fight against your true nature, all it's gonna do is make you feel worse at the end of the day. Because we can try as much as we want to toughen up and fit in and get a thicker skin and all these sorts of things, but it's never gonna actually work. It might work for a little bit. You might be able to pretend. You might be able to you know, fake it till you make it, right? But at some point, it's gonna end up biting you in the butt because you cannot change your true nature. And so a lot of this is about recognizing who you are, how you are, why you're different, and then looking for the good in it because there's so much good in it, you guys. There's a reason why most sensitives become healers and therapists and coaches and doctors and you know authors and leaders is because we're naturally creative, we're naturally empathetic, we're naturally intuitive. We have really great leadership skills. We're visionaries. There's so much that comes from having this gift, but you have to be able to get out of your own way to learn how to really maximize the benefits and minimize the challenges of this trait that we have because there are a lot of challenges that come with it and those tend to really get triggered during the holidays, right? I know that before I learned a lot of these tools, you know, of how to really take care of my sensitivity and stand up for my sensitivity, I used to just hate the holidays. I mean, it would shut me down because I wouldn't say no to anything. And so I would overbook myself, right, with all these social engagements. And it's not that I didn't want to go to them, right? I'm sure you guys relate to this. It's not that I don't want to go. I love my friends. I love being around people. But I also really, really need alone time. And I can't overbook myself or I get depleted really fast. And I just know that about myself now. But back then, I would never say no to anything because I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings, you know? I didn't want to make anyone feel like I wasn't showing up for them. And so I would go to everything. And I would go to everything and do everything for everybody else. And I wasn't taking care of myself. And for me, you know, in my 20s around that time, I would just get super drunk at all these parties, right? Because... I was so tired and overwhelmed and resentful because I was not taking care of myself. And so unfortunately, you know, my outlet for that, because we always, there's always going to be an outlet, was to drink because, you know, it helped drown out the noise, right? Like it helped get me through these things. But, you know, in hindsight, like all these drunk holidays <laughs> were not a happy time. And, you know, so... What we need to start to do is to look at what is gonna feel good to us, right? Look at what to, I said, yeah, Debbie says she tends to use food. Yes, and I used food too. Those of you who've been following me for a long time know that I used to have a very serious eating disorder. And that's, you know, that's really good. And actually, Debbie, I'm gonna touch on this. I had it later in my outline, but I'm gonna touch on it now. So, so often, for those of us who are sensitive, we look to something to numb us out and to ground us because it's very hard for us without the proper tools to get and stay grounded. And the holidays make that extra, extra hard because there's so much going on, right? Now food is a really, um, careful how I phrase this, food can make you feel really grounded really fast. And so a lot of sensitives will reach for food when they're feeling uncentered, when they're feeling overwhelmed, when they're feeling depleted because it's a very quick dopamine hit and it can make you, it brings you back into your body right? Um, cause we're like up here a lot. We're up here and we're out here. We're looking at everybody else, like we're tuning into everybody else and we're kind of like up. It's hard for us to get into our bodies. <clears throat> so food, alcohol, um, for some people it's drugs, for some people it's smoking, no matter what it is, when we don't know how to, you know, really take care of ourselves as a sensitive, we're going to reach out for stuff. And here's the thing, guys, is that a lot, of what, a lot of the time what happens is that we do that and then we beat ourselves up for it, right? And then we're like, oh my God, I overate again. I'm so gross. Or, oh my God, I made a fool of myself at that party because I got so drunk. What's wrong with me? Or whatever it is, right? We beat ourselves up. And then when we beat ourselves up, we feel worse. So it's like we're beating ourselves up. We're beating ourselves up, you know? <laughs> and it creates this really vicious cycle. And so for anybody that's still struggling with numbing out activities and I, like you guys I teach this stuff and I have my days 
it's hard. Life is hard. This isn't about being perfect. You know, this isn't about everything changing overnight. This is about setting yourself up for success and having really solid self-compassion because if you do say overeat or drink too much or whatever, it's not going to help you to call yourself names about it. It's not going to help you to, you know, be mean to yourself about it because the reason you're doing those things is because you're suffering. You know, there's feelings there that aren't being dealt with. There's needs that aren't being met. And so to be able to step outside of yourself and have compassion for yourself in those moments is what's really going to set you up to get to a point where you're not doing that anymore or as much, right? And this is hard. A lot of the tools that I teach, they take time. This stuff is like a muscle. You have to work it. You have to practice. It's a practice. You know, it's not, I always tell my clients like, we're never going to have a day or a point in time when everything's just like tied up in a neat, pretty little bow and you're like done, you know, even though, um, some of us, including me would love that. Um, <laughs> But that's just not how life is, right? These things are practices and we have to really, you know, work at them and, and get stronger at them. Um, and anything that's going to tell you that it's an overnight fix or a quick fix is usually a load of shit. Um, you know, things that are really going to help you take time. They take time and they take energy and they take attention, but they work, you know, they work and they help you to feel so much better. Um, so let's talk, let's talk about boundaries real quick. Cause this is a big, big, big one for a lot of us. And, you know, it took me a really, really long time with this. Um, I would feel so guilty for saying no to anything. I had a very hard time standing up for myself. Uh, before I was a coach, I worked in the advertising world and that is, uh, competitive, um, uh, often toxic environment. And I just let people walk all over me when I was working there until the end. Um, because I didn't know how to stand up for myself. You know, I felt like if I fought back or if I said anything about it, or if I said no to something I was being asked to do that, you know, I was going to hurt somebody or they weren't going to like me anymore, you know? And so it's, it, it is really hard. It can be really scary to say no. It can be really scary to set boundaries um, because we're afraid a we feel like you know a lot of us are still carrying around this wound of, hi Sarah hi. Um, a lot of us are still carrying around this wound of you know oh there's something wrong with me right um, and so we almost it's almost like we're constantly trying to make up for this inherent flaw that we feel like we have and whether we're sub we're consciously aware of that or not this is something that I see with a, with I definitely had this myself you know and it still comes up for me and tough from time to time um, and for a lot of my clients so we don't want to do anything like if we're already feeling wounded and if we're already feeling flawed we don't want to do anything that's gonna in our minds like add to that right so we tend to make ourselves doormats for people now here's the thing about this is that like I mentioned before there's a light and a shadow side to everything right and so we have huge loving empathetic amazing hearts and that is fucking awesome and that is a really beautiful thing and I'm not saying that that's bad it's like one of the best parts about us right but the flip side of that is that we're so outward focused and because we can feel everybody else's feelings we generally are tending to things outside of ourselves and get used to not tending to things inside of ourselves <clears throat> and a lot of times we feel like if we don't show up for everything and everyone and do everything possible to make other people happy, right? That we're not like being the best that we can be. But what happens, and I'm sure you guys know this because I'm sure it's happened to you before, is that when you do that, you end up so depleted and so overwhelmed and so exhausted that then a lot of times we just retreat, right? And then we'll isolate and hermit because we're so tired because we wore ourselves out and we're so stressed and anxious and a lot of times depressed because we aren't tending to our own feelings and our own needs aren't getting met. <clears throat> and so if you want to really, really be there, oh, thank you, Debbie. Yes, see, you are not alone. It's talk to any sensitive person and they <laughs> will relate to this. But see, what happens is that when we want to be there for people so much, 
but we're not going to be able to really help people as much as we actually want to if we are not helping ourselves first. I mean, there's a reason that there's that saying, you can't pour from an empty glass, right? Cliche, okay, fine, but it's true. If you're not taken care of, if you don't have a solid foundation of self-care, if you don't have a solid foundation of a relationship with yourself and, you know, peace within yourself, you're not going to be able to, it's not that you can't help people, but think of how much of a better partner, employee, friend, you know, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever you could be if you were coming from that calm, centered, connected to yourself place, right? And so this is something that, you know, it took me so long to learn this. Like I told a story recently about, you know, when I was growing up and uh, my mother was struggling with really bad depression and I completely, you know, rearranged my whole entire life to be there for her every single day. Now that's sweet and wonderful and I did it because I love my mom deeply, but I wasn't taking care of myself because I was so busy taking care of her. And I finally realized that A, I wasn't doing her any good being stressed out and anxious and overwhelmed and you know, that wasn't helping her, but also I wasn't setting a good example, right? And here's the thing you guys is there's no limit to your love, okay? You can love yourself, be there for yourself, meet your own needs, and still be amazing to everybody else, right? Saying no is a radical act of self-love. You have permission to say no to whatever you need to say no to. And when you go into the holidays with this attitude, right, it is going to be so much better for you because the parties that you do choose to show up for, the social engagements that you do choose to show up for, you're going to be present. You're going to be there, right? You're really going to be enjoying yourself instead of just going through the motions because you feel like you have to be every place every time. And will some people get their feelings hurt? Maybe, you know, but you have to remind yourself, like, I always say this to my clients and they get so annoyed with me, but it's, it's good, but it's good advice. Okay. Ask yourself what you would tell a friend. You know, if you had a friend in this same situation that was struggling really hard with all these social engagements, chances are you would be like, oh my God, say no to some of them. Cancel, right? So why doesn't the same go for you? And this is a good tool for anything where you are, you know, being really hard on yourself or beating yourself up, like remind yourself, what would I say this to a friend? Or what would I say to a friend? And chances are, it's going to be quite different than what you're saying to yourself. And so then you have to ask yourself, why? Why do you feel like you don't deserve the same things that they deserve? Right? Why do you feel like, you know, you shouldn't be as kind to yourself as you would be kind to them? And these are just really good questions to start asking ourselves. And look at things as much as you can. Again, some of these things are much easier said than done and I recognize that and it takes time, right? Um, awareness is gonna be your best friend. The more we can be aware of how we're talking to ourselves, um, you know, the types of things that we're telling ourselves about ourselves and look at that stuff with curiosity and not judgment. So instead of being like, oh my God, I beat myself up all the time, ugh, I suck. Then it's like, you're back to beating yourself up for beating yourself up, right? But if you can be like, wow, I'm really kind of mean to myself. Like, what's up with that? Where did this, where did these messages come from? How long have I been saying this to myself? You know, is this really true? Is this the way that I want to talk to myself? Is this serving me? Is this supporting me? You know, and why do I think that I deserve to be talked to this way? And so when you look at it, it's almost like you're doing detective work. You know, you're just being curious about what's going on with yourself. And then, you know, bringing in the self-love and compassion. And another tool that I used in the very beginning, when I really, really had a very, very low self-esteem, I didn't have the kind of love for myself to even be able to really do anything to support myself or take care of myself. So I used to tell myself, well, if I don't, you know, if I'm not taken care of, then I can't be there for others, right? And that was what gave me the motivation in the beginning to be nice to myself. And so if you have to use that in the beginning, use that in the beginning. I promise you at some point, you're going to do it for you because of you, because you love you. And the more that you, you know, are kind to yourself and compassionate with yourself and use this, you know, curiosity versus judgment tool, the more that you're going to heal your relationship with yourself. And then you start to reap the benefits of that. Then you start to see that not only do you feel so much fucking better, 
but that things around you actually are going so much more smoothly and then you're able to really step into your purpose whatever that may be whether that's being a mom or whether it's your career or whatever that is you're able to show up more fully because you're coming from a place of being supported and taken care of and when you're connected to your own needs that is going to make you able to meet other people's needs even more even though that might sound you know backwards but it's not i promise and you know we need to learn how like these things are skills i always say that i feel like self-love and self-care are should be subjects in school like they should be taught in schools to children because these things are skills and a lot of times you know if we grew up in a family for better or worse even if they meant well you know they did not teach us these tools about taking care of ourselves and connecting to ourselves how are we going to know how to do them you know some of it comes naturally but most of it doesn't they're skill sets and so, you know, when we can take the time to start learning this stuff, you're really setting yourself up for success. So one of the things that we need to learn as sensitives is how do we even connect to what we need, right? I'm going so off my outline right now, but hopefully, hopefully this is resonating with you guys. I, I go off on tangents, um, but it, because I'm so passionate about this, right? Like in the beginning, a lot of clients that I, hi Charlotte, a lot of clients that I work with, you know, I'll be asking them questions. They're like, I don't even know what I want. I don't even know what I need because they have been trained they've trained themselves unconsciously throughout their life to be so connected to what other people need and what they can do to take care of other people that they literally don't even know how to connect to and tap into what they want because they're not used to you know going through life based off of what they want they're used to going through life based off of being who they think that they're supposed to be to make everybody around them the happiest possible right I lived my life like that for so long, so long, that when I first started doing this self-growth work, I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't even really know who I was, you know? And so it, again, it is a skill to know how to connect to what you want so that you can start to tap into what it is that's really gonna make you happy, right? And know how to meet your own needs. And so, again, awareness is going to be your best friend in this. Like notice times throughout the day that you're the most happy. Notice the environments that you're happiest in, the people that you're happiest around. Like note that stuff, you know, type it in your phone, have a note in there for it, put it in a journal, pay attention to when you feel peaceful and at home and on purpose. And another thing to tap into your needs is you can work backwards, right? So, okay, say you're super anxious. So what do you need to not be anxious anymore? right? Check in with your body. Like ask yourself a lot of times I'll have people close their eyes. Hi Jess. Um, you know, close your eyes and like tap in with yourself and be like, okay, I feel super anxious. I feel super overwhelmed. Whatever it is that you're feeling, right? Like what would make me feel better right now? And even if it's just the tiniest thing, if you're like, I need to just go pet my cat or, you know, I, I need to hug my husband or what, whatever, whatever, start there. Pay attention to the things that make you feel better and that make you feel supported, right? And this is, hi Molly! Um, and this is how you can start to tap into, you know, what you really need and what's gonna make you feel better. And you can also experiment with this stuff, you know? I, when you're setting up a self-care routine for yourself, see what feels good. If you don't like something, okay, throw it out. You know, take what works for you and leave the rest, right? Play with stuff and see what makes you feel the most supported. But the most important thing in connecting to your needs and your wants and having a solid self-care routine is that you spend time with yourself, right? Your relationship with you is the same as any other relationship you have in your life. You make a new friend. You have to spend time with that person. You have to get to know them. You have to give them energy and attention, right? It's the same with ourselves, but we so often don't think of it that way. But you really need to spend time with yourself, especially as a sensitive person. Because for us, the world is so loud, right? It's so loud out there. And we're taking in this extra layer of information. And so this is why, you know, it's almost like a roaring, it's, it's like the radio is turned all the way up. There's the noise of the physical world and then there's the noise of the emotional world where we're feeling everybody else's feelings and we're taking in so much. And so it is imperative that we learn how to spend time with ourselves because we need to be able to hear our own voice. And in the midst of all of that noise out there, the emotions and the physical world, and then pair that with the way that we've been brought up, oftentimes, not everyone, but oftentimes, you know, that has led us to disconnect from our own wants and